Welcome to episode 89 of Live with the Maverick. My name is Dominic Lee, founder of Maverick Actuary. We are a content community. Our mission is to maximize the impact and value of quant professionals on a global scale. The goal of this series is to educate our community on the most relevant themes in actuarial science, risk management, and analytics. The theme of today's discussion is actuaries in consulting. And we are very excited to have with us our guest for today's episode, Ron Kozlowski. Ron is lead consultant at RTK Actuarial and Professional Services. So welcome, Ron. Thanks, Dan. Good to see you again. Last time I saw you was at the Caribbean Actuarial Association meeting in Trinidad. So fairly recent towards the end of the year. <laughs> the, the, the trip to the Caribbean is always a tough one, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, just love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Okay, um, I'm going to go a, a little bit through my through my background. Um, so I started my career almost 40 years ago. I joined a company called Aetna Life and Casualty. While today you might think of it more as a health company, back then they had a property and casualty arm. And one of the great things about that was that they had a fantastic study program where you would. Uh, you know, get all your study time, you'd rotate through uh, different areas every 12 to 18 months, they'd rotate you into new areas. So just when you felt like you were learning something, they'd switch you to a new one. And, and there I had a chance to work on, you know, personal lines and commercial lines, both rate making, reserving, corporate actuarial. Then in 1992, I joined a company uh, called Tillinghast, which went through a number of name changes to Towers Perrin. They merged with Towers Watson. Um, then they, uh, I think, acquired EMB. And today they're known as Willis Towers Watson. But I happened to resign the day they made that announcement or the day before. <laughs> and I knew nothing about it. Uh, but I worked for a consultant for 23 years with them in Hartford, Atlanta, San Francisco, Hong Kong, and then back to San Francisco. And then in 2017, I started up my own actuarial consulting firm, kind of wanted to you know, have more choice over what I wanted to do. And so I started my own firm. And um, But I feel today, mostly what I do is, is volunteer for the CS. I think it's a great organization and I do all things Asia. So I'm the CS's Asia ambassador. I also do a lot on professionalism and planning conferences, both in the U.S. and international. And if you happen to have seen uh, the link in post that uh, that Dom had done, um, Andy Dow commented on my <laughs> fishing abilities. So I, I do a lot of things outside actuarial. Um, I love to fish. I love to motorcycle ride, which might not be typical for an actuary, uh, but I run, hike and travel. And um, we had to do this call this week because I'm off to Raja Ampat, Indonesia to snorkel for the next two weeks because I want to see the coral reef before climate change starts to affect it. Wow. Lots of interesting um, hobbies and activities there. <laughs> the the uh the hiking and you said you said hiking right yes. or running yeah okay yeah that i think my last guest had that too so it seems to be a, a trend in the actuarial community that's a good one i think the older you get yeah. you start to hike more <laughs> yeah yeah and i will mention I, I alluded to this earlier that if you're okay with me saying this that ron is um you know an honorary uh, adopted son of the Caribbean, so he's an honor. He's an honorary member of the Caribbean <laughs> actuarial community, <laughs> having Thanks. been involved in in um with the Caribbean for some time now. So, just wanted to mention that. Um, anything you want to say about that? <laughs> no, you know, I, I mean, the Caribbean is um, it's always busy doing lots of things on an international stage. They have great volunteers, but they lack um a lot of property casualty actuaries. So. I've been trying to tie them a bit more with the CAS in terms of, mm -hmm. hey, we can do these things. And, you know, during our talk today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work I do with other actuarial societies around the globe. So it's a small lift to ask us for help and we can deliver. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll see more. I'm on their GI committee and also on some of their climate change committees. 
And uh, so hopefully we'll do more for the GI community. Excellent. So let's get into it. I didn't mention that the theme of today's, today's discussion is actuaries and consulting. As someone who's spent several years uh, in the industry as a consultant, you know, what are the key considerations in becoming an effective consultant? We talk about impact and value with my brand. So this is like right down, the, right up the alley of value and, you know, just becoming, being effective. Well, we could probably talk about, you know, what you need to become a, con a good consultant and we could probably have a podcast that would last about a year. So I, I'm going to pick a couple things. And I think one of the things that I've always struggled in my career is whether or not to be a generalist or a specialist. So I love learning new things. And all throughout my career at the Aetna and, and even in my personal life, I like to do a lot of different things. But one thing that I saw and I, every once in a while, I'll refer to it as Tillinghast, because uh, that's the name that most dear and near to my heart, is that at Tillinghast, what I found was that the most successful consultants tended to specialize, right? So there was a trade-off of how easily you could sell business as a specialist versus a, a generalist. And even though I knew that, I kind of still preferred to be a generalist a lot of times. So back in those days at Tillinghast, there were three practice areas, insurance, corporate, you know, companies like Levi Strauss, et cetera, and then professional liability clients, which were usually healthcare related, physicians, hospitals. And so I worked in one third in each of those areas and they kept trying to say, you should do one. And I would say, well, you know, I, I love all three. So and I love some of the clients that I had. Um, I also had a lot of subspecialties during that time. I joined Tillinghast because I wanted to, to do M&A work. But at that point, there was no M&A work. So I ended up going into catastrophe modeling, writing code, and you know, learning about how to develop cap models. And then you know, I liked the medical malpractice and working with physician-owned insurance companies. I mean, if you ever have a client, a great client, it's going to be doctors. That's what I found for this. Um, and then the last thing, which was probably defined more of my career, was construction defects. But let me talk a little bit about construction defects. And so I, I in the mid-1990s, I started working for insurers and, and reinsurers. And then eventually, as you know, the business wasn't very good insurers and reinsurers were reacting to this, they started raising the uh, self-insured retentions. So a lot of the large home builders had retentions of 5 million or 10 million, and maybe they would have that for specific states as compared to countrywide. So started to eventually move over into the home builders as well. So I got to see everything from both sides, which I thought was really, really great. Um, now, one of the reasons why CD is difficult is that the past isn't always a good predictor of the future. So there were things like precedent sent, setting legal decisions, uh, jury awards, changing policy forms, notice and opportunity to repair laws. And all of those things said you shouldn't just square a triangle. So there's also a really long statute of repose uh, that tends to be, you know, on the shorter side, maybe six years, on the longer side, 10 years. So you can file claims for a long time. And generally, um, the way you end up analyzing construction defect is to break it into the claims that are known already and then the claims that are going to occur in the future. So you'll do more of a report year methodology on reported losses. And then you'll use an frequency and severity approach for IBNR. Um, one of the things that I loved about working at Tillinghast was that all of the offices worked together. So they had made a pact that on little known projects and things that required you know, more depth of knowledge, they would contact other offices and say, hey, you're the expert in here. Why don't you work on this? So at Tillinghast over the years, 
I saw probably maybe close to 100 different insurance companies, construction defect uh, reserves, and you know, got to, to work on a lot of them, got to peer review some, got to be an advisor on some. And, and that was really helpful for building a industry uh, knowledge base. And, and I think that was one of the things that, you know, when we talk about the generalist versus the specialist, that allowed me to be a specialist in construction defects. And one of the other things that I did when working in that industry was that it was really helpful to attend conferences mm -hmm. on construction, you know, whether or not to learn new construction practices or, you know, rub shoulders with the risk managers, you just found out a lot more of what their concerns were. And, and oftentimes it wasn't directly related to what I was, was doing, but I was learning what was keeping them up at night. And so, you know, for those of you listening in today, one of the things I would say to really help your career is to spend more time understanding the business that you're analyzing. Don't think of it as just numbers, like really go down and, and try to figure out, you know, if it's cars, well, what are the new types of cars? You know, how, how are people dealing with electric vehicles and how is the safety features changing? You know, if you're working in retail or education, you know, try to spend a little time in those industries. And another thing I would say about consulting, and I have probably three more points to make, is that I think the most successful consultants are good at solving clients' business issues and problems. And there was a, a certain gentleman who used to work for me, was so good at trying to relate the actuarial work to the client's issues. And, um, and, and I was just really amazed on that. And then I saw, you know, a little bit after that, that Jessica Leung and Steve Armstrong were really trying to sell this point across the CAS to like, mm -hmm. hey, we're not just math guys. Like we solve business problems. Mm -hmm. So if you want to become a good consultant, you need to figure out how to solve business problems and relate it. It's not just squaring a triangle for reserving. It's, you know, what are they worried about? What are the risks? What are they doing? What should they change? And, and one thing I'd say is whenever you're doing a report, always try to add value. You know, I hate compliance work, right? No, nobody really loves compliance work. I always tried to figure out, okay, so somebody needs something, but how do I add some value to it? So a lot of times in our reports, I'd, I'd always want to stick in a section that would say that, you know, hey, maybe there was a book of business they, you know, they should relook at, or maybe we had to cut the data differently or segment it, something that would provide value. Another challenge with being a consultant is that somebody has to sell the business, right? And so people who tend to sell, who have the ability to sell as consultants, tend to do better. I mean, there's things like revenue credits and how you get paid. But, you know, even if you're not a good seller, find a good seller to help sell your business. And I think that's really important. And, and I've worked with some fantastic actuaries that just didn't like to sell. So mm -hmm. I would sell it and take them along so that they could prove they have the expertise. Mm -hmm. But I would do, you know, more of the selling. And uh, that's something that I didn't have early in my career, but later in my career, I, I really relished that opportunity. And, and the last thing, which I won't talk in detail, is you need great communication skills, right? Whether or not it's delivering the results, whether or not it's staying in touch with somebody, whether or not it's sending them articles to say, hey, you're thinking of them, you need great communication skills. So Dom, are you ready to, you know, re-up as a consultant? <laughs> I mean, technically, I kind of um part. I'm a pseudo consultant, no, because working in software pre-sales, you know, I'm on. I'm a part of the sales cycle day in day out. So a lot, but a lot to unpack there is a few things. First of all, love that call out on solving the business problems. So both Steve and Jessica were former guests on the podcast. So check out those episodes. I don't remember the numbers. Jessica, I think early twenties. Steve, early thirties. Um. 
a couple other things. When you, when you talk about the generalists versus specialists, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something I've certainly struggled with in my career and I, I genuinely believe a lot of actuaries do. I remember there was one CLRS seminar, I forget who the person, they meant they, they use a, an analogy to talk about uh, the actuarial value prop and who actuaries are. And it, the analogy he used was were like general contractors. So we're not, so when a house is being built, we're not necessarily the plumbers or the carpenters, but we need to understand how the pieces come together. And I think that was a really good analogy. And I think I might have interpreted it too literally because I think I missed up the piece about the specialist. I think the specialization piece is really important. I guess you could argue, depending on the role, generalist versus specialist, you know, it just, but I think the specialization has to be there in something. And I truly believe that, you know, specialization is a secret sauce and, you know, people love to have go-to people. One challenge that I've found, at least from my insurance background, is that I, I, I found that people who are subject matter experts tended to be compartmentalized from people who were perceived to be leaders. So I think sometimes people who end up specializing tend to get put into a corner and sometimes don't get some of those leadership opportunities. So I'm hoping that um, that changes and continues to change. Not quite sure what you thought, what what you observed in the consulting world. I, I, you know, I never worked as an actuarial consultant, so kind of yeah, quite. I, you know, I think you, as, as a leader of a consulting firm, you've got to recognize that you're not going to know everything. So I, I think you could take somebody and make them a leader. Uh, one, one thing I really believe in that the leaders of consulting firms shouldn't just manage. They should also have to sell business, do work, et cetera. Because then you understand, you know, some of the changes organizationally and, you know, some of the difficulties that you're putting your staff through. So, um, but I think, I think you can be a leader and a specialist at the same time. I, I agree. And I, I, I think the observation I made was that sometimes it was compartmentalized. Sometimes the, the implication or insinuation, even if not explicitly, the way that promotions were, you know, it was usually the people who were just meeting, people who want to be in meetings, the people who had the deep expertise. You no, know, granted, sometimes they didn't want to be to to be in meetings. And but I, I think there's times where you had people who probably had that those capabilities or that potential, but they weren't viewed as leaders. So I, I fully agree with you. I think that as a leader you should be able to get into the details sometimes. Um, another thing you mentioned is the business, selling the business. And it's funny because ironically, I actually, we just missed each other because I started, I interned, uh, Willis Torres Watson was my first internship. So I guess I started right after you left. And I remember my manager at the time, he explained to me that that was a part of his job is to convince the clients that they need this service, which, which I guess is selling business essentially. And at the time I never thought much of it because I was so early in career. I was just thinking of taking actuarial exams. But when being in a pre-sales role now and being so close to the sales cycle, selling business is really hard. And I don't think a lot of actuaries innately at least have that skill. And it took me a while to appreciate why people who are in sales get compensated that well. It's very hard and you have to be very determined. So I'm glad that um, you, know, you mentioned that. Yes. Selling as a generalist is more difficult. I always use my expertise to sell business. And, you know, I used to joke, like, put me in a room with anyone. I'll I'll take them on and talk about construction defects. And, you know, today there's some great folks working in that area. Um, but it's a lot easier when you can talk about, you know, what's happening, you know, in the marketplace, what risk managers are saying. And, you know, otherwise, if you don't have that expertise, you know, how do you distinguish yourself from from everybody else fully fully agree that that expertise is is uh is critical now something that i think we have in common is um at least from what the limited time i've known you actually funny enough i thought that this i was thinking we, we met before the caa the first time we met it was our, our mutual colleague alejandro nolibos who introduced us it was that it was it was san diego it was cas annual i remember we were having breakfast yeah that's when i met you the first time so i guess it's been a while now but from the you know, during the time that i've met you you definitely strike me as someone who's taken a risk. I mean, just living in Asia for someone who's American, that seems like a risk. Now, the actuary sometimes overlook the importance of taking risk and, you know, the opportunity, opportunities to use their actuarial skills to do other things. So in your career, what are some examples from your career, you know, where you've done something outside the box? Well, when I first joined Tillinghast, one of the issues was that, you know, I joined to do m and I, I mentioned this already, and there just wasn't a lot in the industry. I mean, I, I think I worked on one in the first year. Um, 
but the market kind of dries up over time. And so somebody said, well, hey, Ron, you're not busy. How about, you know, working on developing a cat model? So this was shortly after Hurricane Andrew. Uh, you know, I think RMS was out there and Karen Clark's shop was out there. Uh, but we decided to try to build our own. And, and one of the things I loved about it was there was a lot of risk, but I got to do things that nobody else had really done before, you know, within our firm, at least. And so, you know, I got to work with meteorologists and seismologists, you know, studying the forces that create the wind or the shaking intensity, um, got to work with engineers to determine damage curves. And, and I actually think we paid somebody to shoot a two by four out of a cannon at the side of a building to try to simulate a, a palm tree flying through the air. Mm. And, and so, I mean, there was just some really interesting things that we were doing. And, and then lastly, the stuff that was easy for us to understand was, you know, how to convert the losses uh, from the damage curves and the, the wind or shaking intensity. And the, we also needed exposures. How did we convert that into insured losses, right? Because not everything was insured. And, and so there was definitely a lot of risk. And, and part of the risk was that there was no immediate payout. I mean, it took us years to build the model. And so there wasn't, you know, revenue coming in the door. No one was going to say, hey, Ron, you got a great bonus this year. So, I mean, there was definitely some risk with compensation, but also whether or not the model was going to end up being something that we could we could sell. And, you know, we eventually got the, the model up and running. We were helping reinsurers or insurers figure out how much reinsurance they should purchase. And then we started helping companies determine how they ought to set loss costs to load into the rates and working a lot with regulators on why models should be allowed. But it was fun, you know, rubbing elbows with the likes of people like Karen Clark and I think it might have been Hamet Shaw or something like that at RMS. I probably have the name wrong. Um, but there was a lot of really interesting things. And so all throughout my career, I always tried to do different types of things. But but one time I, I got a call and it was from a, a manufacturer of building supplies. And they said, how'd you like to be part of our uh, class action team? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And they said, well, for this type of product, there's been a lot of uh, lawsuits in the industry we think our product, you know, is the best, but we need to be prepared for if, you know, with this class action, if it, if it, you know, makes it through the courts. And, and what I loved about this, and this isn't the first time that this happened to me, but I was invited by the client to visit the plant to see how everything went from, you know, the raw materials to the finished product to, you know, meet and talk to different people throughout the organization, uh, spent a ton of time with the engineering folks to learn how they tested for product defects and what kind of statistics and what kind of data they had. And so it was a very collaborative effort. And one of the things we also had to do was, you know, it's kind of like the difference maybe between book value or market value, like what do, you know, Here's what it costs, but what, you know, can you sell it for in the market? And, and one of the things we saw was that there were just some crazy judgments going on with, I'll call them sister products in the market. And so we did our analysis and, and I was pretty happy with it. And then we, you know, took it to management and, and explained what we looked at, talked about some market things. And they were actually worried that, you know, the analysis we did wouldn't hold up in terms of what juries would award. And they ended up settling for something like 10 times the losses that we thought were out there. And, you know, we had, OK, you're going to get sued. There's going to be lawyers fees. But there were some other products that had really taken some large hits, you know, and they thought that if the same kind of ratios were used on the other products that they could have a loss 40 times a class action 40 times what we determined it would be so then it kind of came become well what do we need to preserve the company and they could afford something 10 times but 40 times would have shut them down so they ended up settling for something much larger but but that was one of the 
maybe one of the times I really felt like I helped solve a business problem, right? I mean, it was, you know, it was a little actuarial, but there was a lot of considerations. And, and I think that that was just, you know, fantastic. Um, but, you know, working on usual projects definitely taught me new skills, uh, taught me new, new things to look at them different ways. It, it definitely helped me establish new con contacts in the industry. And, and I should say that I think I won some of this work because I went to a construction conference. If I hadn't been at that conference, I don't think they would have ever found me. So if you want to do different types of, you know, cutting edge, thinking outside the box, maybe talk to non-actuaries, right? Talk to the people who need to solve problems. And, and it definitely created new new opportunities. I know that I got some references from that project to some other risk managers at, you know, similar and even different types of companies. But I, I don't know which famous person said this, but, you know, if you never fail, you're not taking enough risks. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember that stuck with me. And, and, and Jim McGinnity, who's the first, act, you know, one of the leaders of uh, who probably started Tillinghast way back in the day, he said something similar. If you don't miss at least a few flights a year at the airport, you're not working hard enough and you're going to the airport too early. And I always kind of laughed at that. And I just saw Jim at the CS spring meeting, but you know, he was the kind of guy who always said, you know, take some risks, fail once in a while, and you'll have, you know, a more fulfilling career. Yeah. You know, you're one step ahead of me. I was going to ask you about, um, you know, some of the rewards of taking that risk, given that we're actuary. So we, we, we want, to know about the not just the risk but the reward as well but you know i think you succinctly summarize that you know you learn new skills you establish new contacts and you create a new opportunity so that's uh you know good to hear that there's some upside one thing i want to ask about is you mentioned that you were were asked to develop this cat model and uh, something that people might ask or wonder about is like there's situations in your career where you may not be asked to do something but then you have the appetite to take risks. So in those situations, like what would you recommend someone do? They're not being asked specifically to do something outside the box, but they're interested. Well, you've got to raise your hand. You've got to express um, an interest to do some things differently. And and I, I find that, you know, in in consulting firms, it always seems like the most productive people are offered the most work. So, you know, if you don't have good productivity, then people are going, hmm, what's going on there? Why, why isn't this? So, you know, maybe it's the rich get richer. Um, but, you know, if you work hard, I think opportunities will come your way. And, you know, once in a while, you have to raise your hand and say, hey, you know, I want to do something different. This isn't working for me. Um, you know, it, it's actually one of the reasons I moved from Hartford, Connecticut to Atlanta was that there were a lot of folks who had great mentors and my mentor who hired me to Tillinghast left to become a, a chief actor of an insurance company shortly after I was there. So, you know, I kind of raised my hand and said, you know, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm not getting enough opportunities besides cat modeling, of course. And, you know, and quickly they're like, okay, well, what office do you want to go to? And um, so, yeah, so raising your hand is not a, um, it's nothing you should be shy about. Yeah. Now, something that we talked about earlier, something unique about your career is that you spent many years practicing in Asia, specifically, I think, in Hong Kong. So how would you describe the market there? How do you describe the market in the Asian region and what countries were you focused on within the scope of that practice? You know, when I first went there, I, I thought I was going to be able to just sell work really easily. And, and when I got there, I realized, like, I had an expertise in cat modeling, but you know, the houses look completely different there. You know, I mean, here we have a lot of lot of actuaries who have single family homes, but there in Hong Kong, everything was, you know, tall, uh, tall apartment buildings and condominiums. And, and I was thinking, well, you know, we've got development factors for that, but the density of these buildings was different. And, and so I started to learn that, you know, while things were the same, they were also very different. Another example was 
um, cars. I mean, most of the cars in Hong Kong were taxis. And it was really expensive to own a car there and in places like Singapore, where you had to, you know, kind of buy a license to own a car. And, and so, you know, selling motor work was what, well, maybe it's not going to be that easy. Maybe I need to sell, sell it to the taxi companies. And, and so definitely the exposures were different. I mean, at that time, there weren't a lot of cars in China. There wasn't a lot of data to analyze, but the amazing thing in China was just how big it is and how in a couple of years, they just had more than enough data to do a lot of the sophisticated analysis. Um, but, you know, what I learned was that there wasn't a ton of data within the market to do a lot of things and definitely do, you know, sophisticated classification analysis, et cetera. So it, it took me a little while to kind of understand the market and the challenges. So, you know, listening more than speaking ended up becoming kind of one of the rules to live live by. You could talk about your capabilities, but you needed to get people to tell you what their business problems were. So, you know, we keep coming back to that. Um, but, you know, during my time, I, I lived in Hong Kong. Um, you know, for those who've been to, to Asia, lived on Robinson Road by the escalators. I still like to go back and you know, walk up to the peak. It was just a wonderful time. But I also spent a lot of time on the road. I mean, I had uh, responsibilities for offices in, in China and Singapore and India and, you know, maybe dotted line to, to Korea and Japan and other ones. But the difference was that there were more mature markets, markets like Japan, uh, Korea, even though I didn't practice there much, I, I would kind of go there and talk to folks, see what their issues were. Uh, you know, in Hong Kong and in Singapore were more developed. There were other actuaries in the market. And the markets that were developing at the time clearly was China. I mean, China didn't have a lot of personal insurance at that time, didn't have a ton of cars on the road. So that was a developing market. Taiwan um, you know, seemed to almost be a little bit more developed, but, you know, their PNC actuaries didn't work on workers' comp. That was done more by life folks. And so I was like, hey, this is a market we ought to get. We know a lot about workers' compensation. And then there were markets like India, which like China just had so much growth potential. And then there was Malaysia and Thailand. M Malaysia was very well regulated, had a great regulator. And, uh, you know, in Thailand, there was there was lots of growth. So uh, those were some of the markets that I, I've worked with. And then more recently, I've interacted with actuaries in Vietnam and, you know, hope to be working with the actuarial societies and in, in the Philippines and, and maybe Pakistan. But you know, people ask me a lot about, you know, moving back and forth between Asia and the U.S. And I think that in the U.S., actuaries can be very technical. But in Asia, actuaries need to be more like general management or business consultants, working with various disciplines to solve problems. So that whole thing about tackling, uh, you know, business problems, I think resonates a little bit more. So I think for technical actuaries, it's easy to move to Asia. Um, but sometimes I, I wonder, you know, will people who've been in Asia want to come to the U.S.? And I think it might be a little bit difficult just because of the some of the technical work. But maybe they might be better with, you know, managing a division or something yeah. like that because they've done more with marketing as well. And, um, you know, in, in markets like Vietnam, and, and I love going to Vietnam, uh, the actuaries there are you know, they're, they're very young and, and just kind of starting off on their careers. And so we were asked um, to help out with rate making and reserving principles. So we actually uh, taught a, a course there. Um, I think it was me, Mary Hosford, and most of the heavy lifting, lifting was done by an actuary by the name of Peter Merzda who's out of North Carolina these days. Uh, I think he used to teach at one of the universities there. And, and you know, so we we're trying to just educate the market on what some of those challenges were. 
And, and it wasn't a CAS sponsored thing. It was more of a grassroots thing. They asked, we got a couple volunteers together and, and that was quite interesting. Um, you know, countries like India, China, and now the Philippines and Pakistan, we're seeing that uh, companies are hiring and training locals to offshore actuarial responsibilities from other markets. And so, you know, the CAS and other folks are, are looking at, you know, how do we, how do we train them? How do we develop them? And, um, you know, there's just so much opportunity for growth in Asia, whether or not it's local or offshoring. But I think one of the big challenges is that their legal mar legal and judicial systems are so much different than ours. You know, you get an injury, you know, here's a small amount of payment where in the U S you're going to court, you're going to have a jury deciding this. And so I think it, it'll have some challenges in terms of, you know, how it's going to uh, develop over time. I had a, I had a couple of follow-ups. So <clears throat> regarding China, India, and Malaysia, in our previous conversation, you talked about detarification. I just wanted to quickly ask, like, I know in the U.S., when we think of tariffs, it, it's, it has more of a negative connotation. It's more like an embargo. But how do you think of the concept of tariffs and detarification in, that, in that, those countries? Well, in a lot of countries in Asia, the government used to set the motor rates, right? There wasn't a ton of expertise, very simple. So in China, Malaysia, and, and India, they've actually had challenges when they try to de-tariff. So tariff is the, the government set rate, de-tariff is when you're, when you're getting rid of it. And you can do it all at once. You can do it in phase you know, approaches. But when you do it all at once, companies tend to go wild, right? You know, everybody's like, we're going to make it up in volume. We're going to write unprofitable business, but we're going to write so much it's going to be profitable. Well, we as actuaries know that that doesn't happen. And in a lot of those markets, when there's lots of new players, you don't have the client loyalty to the carrier. So people will move for the smallest rate difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've definitely talked to some folks uh, most recently, you know, in Vietnam, um, they are starting to go through deterrification. So we we found some representatives from India, Malaysia, China, and even in the U.S. I mean, when I started my career, I think Massachusetts had some rates that would you would call, you know, say that there was a tariff. And I think Jeff Werner had had told me that, you know, well, he, he looks at it that Texas had some tariffs. I don't know what line of business at some point. So, you know, the whole understanding of, of how that works, it's not just a pricing assignment. It's, you know, how do you control agents and underwriters? And how do you look at, uh, you know, what's being paid off for commissions as you're trying to grow market share? Uh, so, so I mean, it's a really interesting thing. And there's there's a few new countries that I'm not going to name that are talking about doing this. And I think it's a great opportunity for the folks who've been through it in Asia to kind of lend their expertise. So I'm looking forward to working on that. One more quick follow, because I get this question all the time on Instagram is with regards to offshoring people in those areas. Some people are asking if it's common to be able to work for a U.S. company in a, one of those regions you mentioned, is that, is that happening today? Would you say like, what you think of it as, is it current state or future state? It, it's current state. Um, when I started going to India a number of years ago, and the first time I went to India for the CAS was 2008. And, and funny enough, I gave a talk on deterrification. I didn't know anything about it. It was just that they wanted somebody from a, a large actuarial association. And, um, so o over the years, you know, I've, I've heard more about it and then it kind of hit a lull, but there are some really large companies um, who have some extremely large actuarial groups. I mean, over a hundred, you know, actuarial uh, students and actuaries doing work of international companies. And, you know, I, there's a few of them. And, and so that is happening more and more. I think the question is a lot of those folks, when they get their credentials, some of them leave to go to more to larger markets, you know, that you might find them going to London. I don't think as much to the US, but but definitely to London. 
And, and also, you know, if you make fellows, you're going to have to pay those fellows a little bit more, right? So there's some challenges with those, those models, but there's definitely a few companies that the plan is to save a lot by going to cheaper markets. I mean, just like manufacturing did. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a risk to us actuaries, you know, how do you play yeah. with that role? But you know, we're, we're not finding that there's lots of GI actuaries unemployed these days. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So, so that's the good thing. Yeah. No. So what are some specific examples of projects that you worked on during your time in Asia? Um, you know, when I first got to Asia, one of the challenges was that it was very compliance focused. So, you know, somebody needed a reserve opinion. So for X dollars, you know, they'd want to want a report. But but the problem was that a lot of the work was, uh, you know, X times three was the cost of it. So it was it was hard to to make money as a as a GI actuary only. So what we ended up doing was doing a lot more M&A activity. And on M&A due diligence, companies aren't really concerned about saving nickels and dimes. They want a good answer, they want a good insightful analysis. So we ended up focusing a lot on M&A activity and, and just develop some great relationships. Um, I wish I could tell the name of this one client, but Every time I was in this one country and they heard I was there, they'd be like, just come talk to talk to us about what you know from other markets. And uh, that relationship, that M&A relationship was just fantastic because they were just eager to learn and to get into the insurance market. Um, but, you know, while I was there, we ended up, you know, moving on from selling, um, you know, reserve analyses to to you know, to the due diligence, but then we started, you know, selling uh, software at that point, you know, my firm had merged with Watson Wyatt. So they had some uh, good pricing software and then we merged with the MB and, and they had a lot of software. So at that point in Asia, we were trying to sell a lot of software markets were growing quite a bit. And then we started doing some economic capital work as well. Um, bank assurance was another type of product that I don't know I don't think it's as prominent today, but banks would make deals with insurance companies to sell their products and they do it for a couple of years and switch it to somebody else. So there was a lot of pricing of that. You know, how much profit can I make on this business, et cetera. So that was something that I'd never seen in the US. Um, you know, when I was in Asia, I think I was there for about a year and then the CAS approached me. Um, I think somebody from the nominating committee said, hey, we'd really like a representative from Asia. You know, we know you've been a, a big volunteer. Would you be interested? So I, I actually ran for the board and was lucky enough to know enough people in the U.S. to to get voted in. So a lot of my time in Asia, I was, you know, talking at conferences, both for for I guess at that time it was Towers Watson, as well as the CAS. So I counted that in the 40 months that I lived there, I did 36 industry presentations on 32 different topics. Wow. And I mean, there were a lot of weekends of, you know, studying things and looking at materials other people had sent me to present. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really love that because I, I learned a lot during that time. But, but, you know, the other reason we were doing is we were trying to raise the profile of actuaries. Life actuaries are very prominent in Asia mm -hmm. and PNC actuaries are are less valued. They get paid less money. We're in the US, the opposite, opposite happens, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so there's there's lots of growth opportunities for PNC actuaries. Um, at, at that time, we were also trying to promote things in the market like captive insurance, which is heavily you know used in the US. Uh, I was trying to talk to folks about medical malpractice and, and trying to get you know, get awards for people who were injured, but, you know, the legal market, judicial market really didn't support it at that time. And, you know, we're looking at more advanced rate making things and just a host of, of different things. Um, you know, even today, I, I still work with actuarial societies in Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and India. And when I'm in Asia, uh, which is usually, you know, a few times a year, we're, you know, visiting the actuarial conferences that these associations are putting together, but we'll visit universities and give talks. I mean, I, I love talking to university folks about 
You know, who would want to be a life actuary when you have so much excitement happening in, in GI, right? And so I love talking to students and try to sway them to to consider GI. And, and GI is the same as PNC. Yeah, but general insurance, yeah. G, GI includes health, I think, in, in a bigger way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we visit universities, regulators, employers. This past February, I was in India and we visited 15 employers, universities and in, in the local actuarial society. And many of the companies we were doing visiting was about offshoring market in India and people were talking how much it's growing. Um, I tend to do a lot of grassroots things. So, you know, while I, I represent the CAS oftentimes, you know, sometimes actuarial societies or, or folks will ask us to do something that, you know, isn't really what the, the CAS, um, you know, needs to be involved in. So in the case of, you know, Vietnam, we found a couple volunteers to do it. Um, and, you know, and that was great. And when we were teaching the basics of rate making and reserving during that course that I talked about earlier, we had 86 people sign up to do this, this course. And I, I can't remember if we started off with like, we thought we were going to do it in 12 weeks and it took 18 or something like that happened where we needed to slow down a little bit. Uh, but 86 people started and it was actuarial students and accountants and underwriters and insurance company executives. And it was, you know, pretty interesting uh, teaching these folks. And, and at the end, the IAV gave a test to see, you know, how many people followed through and gained some competency. And I think about half the people took an exam and, and passed. So that was quite exciting. Excellent. Now, through the course of the episode, we talked a lot about actuarial practice through the lens of consulting and through your experiences in Asia. Yeah. And we focused a lot on general insurance or property and casualty. And I think I think this is partially true for life and some other disciplines. When I think actuarial practice, I think of it as part, uh, well, science, of course, like the math part and then part art. And I think certainly for PNC or general insurance, a lot relatively speaking, more art. And a part of that is developing actuarial judgment. And that's a part, that's, that's a topic that you've recently been involved with. So first of all, how would you define or describe actuarial judgment? Um, you know, the words that come to mind are, are wisdom, insight, experience, uh, astuteness, foresight, intelligence. It's that stuff that we develop over time, right? But in a lot of markets, you're seeing young actuaries, um, you know, whether or not they might be, you know, starting to work for Cruz or, or Uber or, you know, overseas, you'll see young actuaries become chief actuaries of companies. So a lot of people always ask me, you know, how do I speed up my development of actuarial judgment? And, you know, I, I think in, when we talk about actuarial judgment, I probably ought to explain the difference between that and expert judgment, right? You know, statisticians, data scientists, they go through the training, they go through the ex, uh, experience, they, they get expertise. But what separates us and why we can say it's, you know, professional judgment or, you know, that's synonymous with actuarial judgment is that we have a code of conduct that we have to adhere to. And one of the codes within the code of conduct says you need to follow the actuarial standards of practice. So, you know, it covers those two components. It also says in the code of conduct that we have a duty to the public. And so, you know, every time we do anything, we ought to be saying, is this fair to the public? And then lastly, one of the different things is that um, there's a disciplinary component, right? Um, actuaries can be counseled, they can be reprimanded, they can be suspended, or they can be excelled. But I don't think that exists for a lot of other professions. So that's how we get from expert judgment, I think, to professional judgment. And something I'll add to that, certainly as someone who's gone mm -hmm. out of the poor insurance space and is now working with more of the folks you mentioned, whether it's uh, data science or statisticians, in the past, I've now come to appreciate the importance of that code of conduct that you mentioned. I think one thing that sets the actuarial profession apart is that the integrity and the rigor of, um, you know, the, the insights that we provide and us being ac held accountable in some ways to that code. You know, it's it's certainly not the shiniest object in the room when you think of code of conduct and actuarial standards of practice. But I think later in my career, I've, I've certainly come to appreciate it because 
the way that we do things are just different. It's not it's not just a level of detail. It's just the way you think it through and just how thoughtful we are in terms of how we approach our work. So it's something I've come to appreciate. So with regards to actuarial judgment, when do we use actuarial judgment? So, uh, you know, some examples might be what data we choose to do an assignment. You know, how, how do we how do we set it up? Um, you know, what do we do with missing or inappropriate data? How, which models do we select um, or which ones do we rely upon? How do we pick assumptions? You know, assumptions like loss development factors or trends or, you know, adjustments for for climate change, those types of things. Uh, there's testing model outcomes for reasonableness. And, you know, that's something that's a trait of a great actuary. You can look at something and say, this doesn't make sense. This isn't the answer I'm thinking we should get. And someplace in the calculation, something's going to right. Um, there's the interpretation of model outcome. Well, what's this mean for the business? And, um, you know, another thing is, you know, just when you're dealing with things like uh, constraints, on time and money, you know, where can you make shortcuts but not have it affect the analysis? So that's probably just a couple simple and easy to understand examples of of actuarial judgment. So you know, we talked we talked we talked about the importance of actuarial judgment, what it is. I think the next the the most the next intuitive thing to ask is, you know, what are some of the key what are the most important considerations in actually developing actuarial judgment? Well, well Funny story here is that when I figured out that, you know, we wanted to create a, a presentation on developing actuarial judgment, I, you know, went away for a couple of weeks and kind of every day thought a little bit about things that I've learned over my career and, and how I've, you know, learned them. And, and so I wrote this like really long list of things. And, and Josh Tobb, um, who's one of the guys who works for the Infinite Actuary? Yeah, Josh took the easy way out. He used GPT, that GPT <laughs> and said, "How do you create actuarial judgment?" <laughs> and so it came up with a list of eight ways to develop it. And and I'll just go through these quickly. Uh, we could talk a little bit more in depth about a few. But education and qualification, um, learning, um, continued learning understanding the business, practical experience, critical thinking, mentorship, ethics, and communication skills. And so I, I, I've actually given this presentation probably over maybe 20, 25 times kind of around the globe, gave it to, um, I think I've given it in uh, Africa and a webinar and, and given it, um, you know, different places. But, but if we have time, I'd like to just talk sure, about sure. a couple of them. And, and the first one I've actually talked about in me understanding the construction business was that you really need to delve down and understand more about the risks, right? And and I think that, you know, I, I, I've always had a problem with, you know, finding actuaries who I say, well, you know, What's the policy language saying is, well, we've never read a policy in something. And I'm like, okay, you need to know more than just the numbers. So in, in kind of understanding the business, I always say you need to understand the risks. So if it's construction, retail, if it's, you know, personal property, commercial property, commercial auto, you really ought to be trying to understand those risks and what those issues are. Another thing is to understand the business environment, trends, inflation, regulatory issues, uh, third, I'd probably say policy language and contract terms. And oftentimes those don't change a lot. Well, for construction, they were changing a lot. Um, you know, when when there were CMP policies that were now throwing in a little uh, cyber coverage uh, to kind of control their loss, but they'd, they'd offer a small limit. That was a way of kind of, you know, addressing the unknown of how big losses could be and um, you know, whether or not it's excluded, there used to be, you know, mold claims were big for a while. And so companies like, do I include it? Do I exclude it? Do I offer a little limit? So we should be knowing those things. And probably another really important thing is that, you know, you should be talking with underwriting to figure out how the book is changing, how they're re-underwriting it, as well as with the claims folks to understand what new things are popping up, you know, how they see that the book of business has changed in terms of the types of claims 
And I mean, over my career, I've just seen some great presentations on how, say for like a hospital chain, how nurse injuries are changing over time. So, you know, they ended up having lift machines to lift patients. And, and so, you know, getting down into that detail, I think is really good. And if, if you're looking for any type of risk that you're analyzing, I always go back to, um, I think it was a statement of uh, principles on rate making. It used to be one on reserving, one on valuations. And it used to have a list of considerations. And I always go back to that. Uh, I think today, ASOP 53, which is dealing with risk transfer for property casualty companies, uh, there's some great lists of different things to think about as you're analyzing a risk. And, and those that kind of be, used to be my Bible of what was on my bulletin board and, and whether or not it was a class action lawsuit or some, you know, type of warranty or, or something completely different. I would always go through that list to make sure I was asking the right questions and understanding that business. So, so that's the first one I want to talk about. The second one is, is practical experience. And I, I was um, working on getting Jim Gusha, who's an actuary term data scientist uh, to speak about the challenges with AI. And, and we were talking about actuarial judgment and AI at the same time. And, and Jim gave me this quote that, you know, he, he, he says isn't his, that somebody else probably said it first. And, and I'm going to say it uh, twice. Data you use is more important than what you do with the data. So data you use is more important than what you do with the data. Now, by saying it twice, people are going to remember this a little bit more. Um, but I think the point is that, is it better to study the data and learn the intricacies and what's going on? Or is it better to, you know, apply 12 different models for 12 different numbers? And, you know, when you do a, a predictive modeling or you do a, a catastrophe exposure management, a PML analysis, about 60 to 80% of the time is actually studying the data and, and uh, you know, pulling out bad data, filling in information where there's holes in the data. And I wonder how many people on this call probably don't spend enough time looking at that. I mean, I, I probably got so much street cred with a bunch of my clients because I'd ask them about a large claim in their data and they'd say, oh, we forgot to tell you that was a bad faith claim and you can't use that for rate making purposes. So, you know, by really asking great questions about what's in the data and what's happening, I've been able to do much better analysis, um, you know, kind of reinforce to the client that we dive, dove down into the data. So, you know, spend more time on data and that'll help you become a better, more insightful consultant. But also in practical experience, I'd say review your diagnostics. Like I would get angry inside when my staff would pick loss development factors before even looking at, you know, whether or not what was happening with case reserves or settlement patterns or different types of things. Um, another piece of advice is, is perform sensitivity tests. You want to know, you want to be able to tell if something is wrong. Well, play around with the assumptions to see how much they affect the analysis. I mean, I'm amazed. I, I would always be like, well, my 12 to 24 month factor, oh man, there's so much variety in here. <laughs> but then on my final answer, it, it had almost no impact because I was using a target loss ratio approach for the last mm -hmm. year. So why did the 12 to 24 month factor work? And, and the, the other thing I'll say with practical experience is review your work, you know, check it, um, people tend to make the same mistakes all the time. So if you have problems with, you know, figuring out how to do a partial year calculation, you know, make sure you look at that. And I would know by consultant on my team what they tended to, you know, do wrong. And, and this goes into my last uh, category that I want to talk about is mentorship. And, and that's to learn from peer reviews. Every time somebody peer reviews something and you get some feedback, like, Pick, I want a five-year rather than a three-year. Understand why that person is making that suggestion. They might have a different view or see something in the data. Uh, oftentimes, I see people use the latest uh, three of five. 
and I would go ballistic and I'd be like, well, do you know how much you're, you're giving in bad development versus saving and, you know, good development, you know, you're, you're leaving, you know, losses on the table here that we need to be charging for. Um, so there's a story on why people make those comments. And if you could learn from everybody who's peer reviewing your work, um, why they're making those, you're going to learn their insight and, you know, that's a great thing. So, I mean, I would always tell my staff, I'd ask my staff, what's your, what's your job? And they'd say, well, blah, 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 do this. And I said, no, your job is to eliminate my job. You're, you're going to eliminate, I should say my role. You should move into my role and push me up, out, you know, really out. Uh, but I wanted them to like learn everything they could for me. And another piece I'll, I'll give on peer reviews, when you're asking for peer reviews, look at, I, I'd say half the time I'd find somebody who knew, you know, medical malpractice liability and everything that's going on with it. And then other times I'd, I'd ask somebody not as familiar to look at it. And some of that unfamiliar peer reviews have just been fantastic. And let me give you two examples. One time I was doing an analysis of a GLM project, which I am not qualified to do. Um, and the three people working on the project told me I was unqualified to do it, but we needed to get it out. And GL, you sorry, GL or GLM? GLM. And so they were working on mortgage guarantee. And, you know, they had great analysis of, you know, did they have any other outs, outstanding loans? What was their credit score? Where did they live? Education, blah, 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 all these things. Well, I finished the analysis and I said, well, what happens if everything goes sour at the same time? And they said, well, we didn't, we don't have a factor for that in our model. We didn't build that in. I'm like, but don't you think that's important? If the whole market tanks, everything's going to go bad. And they're like, that's a really good comment. So they were so much into the weeds that by having somebody unfamiliar look mm -hmm. at it, they, you know, they saw a glaring error. And the last point I'll make is, or last uh, example I'll make is at one point we were looking at hurricane landfall probability for trying to figure out, you know, up and down the coast, what places were more likely for landfall. And somebody asked the question, well, what about a second landfall? The fact that it hits Florida and goes back out and it hits North Carolina, how are you dealing with that? And, and we didn't even think about it, but that was a fantastic question. So, um, so that, that, those are, you know, some pieces of advice on how to develop actuarial judgment. Um, we give this session or we have given this session a lot. I don't know if the CAS records it because we tend not to record a lot of the professionalism. But if you haven't heard it, you know, look out for it. I think it's a really good presentation, particularly if you're a young actuary trying to figure out how to increase your wisdom. I'm actually happy I, when when I post the episode, I'm happy to share. I think you share the present, whether it's through the link or the actual presentation. I'm, I'm happy to share that because I think it's a really important presentation. So I'll be sure to um to include that in the debrief. Okay. Thanks. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Ron. This has been highly insightful. I was definitely looking forward to this episode. And, um, you know, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with you. And I think a lot of people in the community will certainly uh, glean a lot of valuable, in invaluable insights from this. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I think you're doing a great service for the actuarial community, Dom. And who knows, maybe we'll see each other in person in the Caribbean one of these years. Or in California. I'm not, that, <laughs> you know, we are both in California. Let's not forget that. <laughs> that is true. That is true. All right, Ron. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Take care.